Next on C-SPAN, the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing examines the unemployment insurance system. Hearing of the Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. 53 years ago, the Employment Insurance Program was established as a self-financed system to provide benefits to workers laid off from their jobs. While the Trust Fund balanced receipts and outlays for four decades, it has been in debt since 1973 rocked by two recessions in the 1970s and the recession of 1982. To cope with a depleted reserve fund, states, particularly in the past six years, have made various changes in their policies. They have adjusted business taxes, they have tightened worker eligibility, and they have borrowed from the federal treasury to cover unemployment insurance obligations. The federal government has also made changes, imposing an interest rate on funds states borrow and requiring states to link unemployment insurance taxation and tightened worker eligibility to encourage states to once again have a balanced and adequate reserve. But the shaky health of state unemployment insurance reserves and tightened worker eligibility standards have changed this program from its traditional role as a safety net into a literal crapshoot for workers who have come to depend on the program as an income bridge while seeking new employment after being laid off from their jobs. 97% of wage earners are part of the unemployment insurance system of our nation, yet workers stand on the average only a one in three chance of receiving benefits. Odds vary by state. In only three states do more than half of the unemployed workers receive benefits. And in four states, less than one in five workers receive benefits. The level of benefits vary enormously from state to state. In Hawaii, a worker may receive as little as $5 a week. And in Massachusetts, a worker may receive up to $330 a week. State unemployment insurance dollar reserves from which benefits are paid tell a version of the same story. Six states have a reserve of a billion dollars or more. Other states have very low reserves with Louisiana's fund amounting to less than six cents per capita. And some large industrial states, such as Michigan, have a total fund of only $25 million. A pathetically low figure should a recession come. Because of the variations in state reserves and, and the state's capacity to pay eligible workers from unemployment insurance funds, the federal government has a built-in backup system so that states may borrow necessary resources to meet their obligations to workers who have been laid off. I might add parenthetically that without this backup system, the state unemployment insurance program would have collapsed a long time ago in most of our states. I might also add that it was never the intent of Congress to have a federal backup system which basically takes over from the state unemployment insurance funds. The federal government has built a backup system so that states may borrow the necessary resources to meet their obligations to workers who have been laid off. <clears throat> but with state funds either in debt or severely underfunded, and with worker eligibility at an all-time low, and I want to repeat it, worker eligibility 
for help from state unemployment insurance funds is at an all-time low. I must wonder if we have a national unemployment insurance policy or only just a system of promissory notes. This morning, the General Accounting Office will present a report on the financial health of the unemployment insurance program at the state and federal level and on changes in the system that have affected trust fund reserves and worker eligibility. GAO's report is based on a year-long study requested by this subcommittee on the issue of worker eligibility for unemployment compensation. The, the GAO report focuses on two related issues. One, the adequacy of state unemployment insurance reserves to withstand even a moderate recession, and methods used to build reserves, including policies promulgated in the 1980s which tightened worker eligibility. The news from GAO is extremely disturbing. Few, if any, states could withstand even a moderate recession in the upcoming months based on costs associated with the 1982 recession. A 25% decline in the number of workers eligible to receive benefits has taken place just since 1982, adding to the impact of a potential recession. In other words, states have less money for unemployment benefits than ever, and fewer workers are eligible for those benefits. When this program was first conceived, it was conceived as a counter-cyclical measure, which on the one hand would provide workers who are laid off with income and would provide the economy with some activity at a time of a recession. It seemed both of those goals are in danger of being lost. In spite of cutbacks in eligibility, states must cope with costs of any economic downturn, and this means interim support for laid-off workers at the same time a state must address business recovery. Most states now find themselves in the singularly uncomfortable position, much like a high-wire circus performer, balancing the unemployment insurance business tax and the need to keep the state competitive for new and continued business development, and at the same time ensuring workers adequate and fair protection through unemployment insurance benefits. In addition, some states are still in the process of paying back earlier borrowing from the federal government in the 1970s and the 1980s to handle shortfalls in the state systems. The importance of GAO's report today is that we will have this information before we face another recession, as we surely will. And we will have an opportunity to address the problem of state reserve underfunding, unreasonably tight eligibility standards for workers, and policies which encourage these problems to continue and to become accentuated. We cannot predict with precision when the next recession will take place. But the business cycle has not been repealed. We can predict that without a change, the next recession will take a high toll on workers and their families, on the federal budget, and on the speed and equity of recovery in all of our states. I look forward to receiving the GAO report and comments from the Department of Labor, the AFL-CIO, and several state fund directors. Let me also at the outset express my appreciation to uh, Ms. Lisa Phillips uh, of the subcommittee staff who uh, prepared uh, most of the work for this hearing. I would also like to express my thanks to my colleague, Congressman Grant, who will take over for part of the time because the Foreign Affairs Committee is holding a hearing on uh, Iran, and I will have to attend part of that hearing. Congressman Grant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to uh, your lead. I have no further comment. Thank you very much. Our first witness is Mr. William J. Uh, Gaynor, Associate Director, Human Resource Division, 
U.S. General Accounting Office. We are very pleased to have you, Mr. Gaynor. Your entire prepared testimony will be entered into the record. You may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the subcommittee. Uh, we're very pleased to be here today to share with you some results from our recently completed analysis of the UI trust funds and the beneficiaries thereof. Could you identify <coughs> your colleagues who accompany yes. you, Ms. Gaynor? Uh, to my right is uh, Charlie Jessick, who is the principal uh, analyst on this project. He's a, uh, a labor economist who's been with GAO a couple of years. To my left is Sigurd Nelson, who's the uh, senior economist in the area of uh, labor and education programs and uh, heads all our work related to uh, uh, labor and uh, economic uh, aspects of the labor economy. Well, with an economist to the right of you and an economist to the ref left of you and an economist facing <coughs> you, you are really in trouble. I feel somewhat uh, you, surrounded. You, you, you may proceed. <laughs> uh, in particular today, I'm going to discuss the general financial health of the UI trust funds over the last 20 years and the actions taken by states in response to recessionary conditions in the last decade and to new federal loan policies during the 1980s. Our major conclusions are as follows. There has been a long-term decline in the adequacy of trust fund reserves. This decline in turn in reserve adequacy has contributed to massive state borrowing, particularly during the 1980s. Concurrently, there has been de a decline in the proportion of the unemployed receiving benefits, which was likely influenced strongly by these recessionary conditions and the changes in federal policies that occurred thereafter. Future recessions threaten a repeat of the same pattern that we saw in the 1980s. That is, inadequate reserves, followed by insolvency, followed by federal borrowing by state funds, and another round of reductions in the proportion of the unemployed receiving benefits. Before elaborating on these points, I'd like to give just a little background on the system. The UI system's primary objectives are two. First, to provide employees with temporary insurance against income loss during uh, economic downturns and spells of unemployment, and second, to provide some countercyclical uh, stimulus to the economy uh, during periods of uh, economic downturn. The UI system has traditionally operated on a self-financing principle. That is, reserves were accumulated during periods of economic ex expansion and benefits were paid uh, during economic declines. As I go through our findings one by one, I think it will become clear that uh, uh, the, the problems of inadequate reserves have a direct relationship to an eroding of the basic purposes of this program. To determine whether state trust fund reserves uh, are sufficient to pay benefits during a recession, we examine trends in a variety of measures of uh, uh, fiscal adequacy for these uh, reserve funds. Uh, the one we use principally here today is known as the high cost model, or high cost multiple. It's the most accepted measure of uh, fund adequacy. It essentially measures the extent to which uh, reserves are adequate to pay recession level benefits for some period of time. The standard we've used here is 1.5 for the high cost multiple, which uh, is uh, equivalent to saying that the uh, reserves at 1.5 would be uh, adequate to pay recession level benefits for a year and a half. And as I go through uh, some of the numbers here, I think the reason for that year and a half will become more evident. If you look at the, uh, the first chart here to the right, or to my right, uh, you see that in, uh, in uh, 1969, uh, the majority of trust funds were adequate. The uh, overall high cost multiple at that time was about 1.8. But even with a 1.8 aggregate multiple for the entire system, there were some funds that did not have adequate reserves. Uh, by 1987, however, uh, after three major recessions in the 70s and 80s, uh, and a couple of small recessions thrown in for good measure, you see that the uh, number of funds that are adequate uh, as of the end of 1987 by our uh, measure was down to four. Um, current reserves at this time would be adequate to uh, cover a recession uh, equal intensity in intensity to those of the past of about eight months and pay benefits during that time without the, uh, the entire fund, uh, as it were, going into uh, insolvency. 
Inadequate reserves, uh, as I said earlier, have led to uh, massive borrowing, particularly during uh, uh, the 1980s. 31 trust funds became insolvent. There were more that borrowed during the, uh, the uh, uh, 1970s and 1980s, but 31 were insolvent by our measure, which is somewhat conservative. And 30 billion in federal loans were made during that time, uh, about two-thirds of that during the 1980s. Uh, the line graph here, I think, illustrates pretty well why it is necessary to have uh, reserves going into any recession. If you look at 1969, as I said uh, a moment ago, the aggregate high cost multiple there was 1.8, which means that a, uh, starting there in 1969, one could have expected the reserves in this system to have been good for well over a year and a half of recessionary conditions. In 1970, we went into a, uh, a short, uh, mild recession uh, in which uh, the aggregate uh, high cost multiple went down to 1.2. So a recession of, a, of less than a year without severe unemployment rates brought it down to about 1.2. Uh, we went along at about that level until uh, November 73, when another recession began and lasted till March 75. That was a period of 17 months. When we came out of that recession in uh, March uh, 75, um, unemployment was still at 9.9 percent. And you can see in, in 75, the um, amount of federal borrowing, or the number of insolvent trust funds, which is actually the measure we show here, uh, started to rise uh, rather steeply and uh, has remained at a fairly high level, uh, high when you consider that these funds are supposed to be self-sufficient except in uh, rare instances, uh, remained at a fairly high level right through to uh, uh, the recent past. Uh, now, unemployment, as I said, at the end of that recession was at 9 percent. The number of funds that were solvent was down to uh, just one or two, and the, the uh, number of, uh, of uh, funds that we consider to have adequate reserves remained at a very low level until the recent past. Um, if you look on down along to uh, 1980 and 1981, um, you see uh, we had a mild recession in 1980, uh, which uh, brought borrowing up a bit there, and the number of insolvent funds increased. In 82 and 83, we went into another 17-month recession, which, when it ended, in November 1982, we still had um, unemployment rates of 10.7, and the unemployment rates persisted at high rates for a considerable period of time after that. It took a fair amount of uh, tax increases and other measures by the states uh, to bring down that borrowing from 83 to 85 and to bring uh, the number of states uh, that were insolvent in into reasonable control. But you can see that the uh, high cost multiple there for the uh, aggregate uh, system and uh, the line charted there, the number of trust funds that were, uh, which we consider to have adequate funds, remained very low right through 1986. Uh, now, the reasons for uh, uh, the uh, recent inadequacies <coughs> in uh, trust fund reserves are multifaceted. Um, some of the actions have to do with um, the nature of the economy, things that are beyond the control of the states and the federal government. Some has to do with actions that were taken by the states and the federal government. First of all, in the 1980s, we saw unprecedented unemployment rates above 8 percent on average for uh, most of the 1980s. That compares to about 4.8 percent average unemployment in the 1960s. So the, just the change in the overall level of unemployment has made a big difference. And uh, with higher unemployment rates, you naturally get more long-term unemployment, that is, unemployment that exceeds 26 weeks. And that, uh, that means that the spells of unemployment are longer, people draw on the system longer, and that drives down your reserves. Uh, three major recessions, as I said, during that time period, uh, leading to that high unemployment. So we've had uh, a period in which uh, states have not had an opportunity to recoup reserves through the natural process of building up over a long period of time. And I think that indicates that some kind of action is necessary. 
You also had an extended benefits program that, which was put into place by the Congress to aid the unemployed during these recessionary times. However, um, that was not funded at the state level by tax increases. That amounted to something like $8.5 uh, billion in terms of increased expenditures for the states which were not funded. Um, over a longer period of time, during the 60s and 70s, the states have gradually tied benefits to inflation, but they did not tie uh, revenues to inflation. So that whereas the, by 1987, 37 states had indexed their uh, benefits to the average manufacturing wage in the state or some other measure of uh, wage inflation, uh, very few had uh, uh, tied their uh, tax measures to uh, an increase in the uh, benefit level or an increase in the wage level. Uh, finally, um, uh, you put all these factors together and they mean that uh, generally uh, expenditures have been up and revenues down during this uh, last 15 years. If you look at the benefit side of this equation, you see that a number of, uh, of uh, things have occurred which have uh, caused the, uh, the proportion of those unemployed to go down. Now, I might note that in 19, uh, during the 1960s, about 70 percent of workers were actually insured by the unemployment insurance programs. By 1985, about 97 percent of workers were insured. If all things were equal, you would expect the percentage of all those unemployed to have gone up between the 60s and 1985. But as you see, the percentage of those uh, receiving benefits did not go up. It went down from about 43 percent on average in the 1960s to uh, not the lowest point, but uh, a recent low point of 31 percent in 1985. The causes are multifaceted. and. Uh, I, I don't want to make too much of the policy changes, but they, I think they are significant because they're the ones that can, can be controlled by policymakers. First of all, workforce demographics have changed. You have more women in the market. You have more youth in the labor market. They have tended to um, have a weaker uh, 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 a word I want. a weaker attachment to the uh, labor market, they're more likely to be unemployed uh, voluntarily, and so that's driven down the recipients re recipiency rate somewhat. You also have a growth in the service sector, which is more likely to uh, uh, use uh, part-time workers. It's more likely to uh, have uh, workers with a casual attachment to the labor force. So all in all, those two trends together have brought down the likely recipiency rate under unemployment insurance. But I don't want to uh, discount the fact that federal policy changes have very likely had a significant impact as well. Uh, these policies uh, were, um, I think, sensible. They were uh, the Congress's uh, last attempt to deal with a solvency problem and to do something about the fact that reserves uh, were declining and to do something about the fact that uh, uh, borrowing was up and it was substantial. But they have uh, nonetheless uh, resulted in some other changes. In 1980, Congress uh, started enforcing penalty taxes. Prior to that, um, if a state was uh, insolvent, uh, you generally had uh, a forgiveness on the part of the Congress. Uh, interest was not paid on uh, the loans, or uh, there was a, a period in which uh, the solvency uh, uh, penalty tax didn't click in at the, at the state level so that employers didn't have to pay more to make up those reserves. Uh, uh, Congress uh, stopped that policy. It also began charging on interest on loans. Prior to 1981, uh, loans uh, taken out against the federal unemployment uh, uh, fund uh, were uh, not charged interest. When the borrowing increased, that started to create a significant drain on the federal treasury, and uh, Congress decided to charge interest to, interest to get repayments. Uh, finally, uh, in 83, the Social Security Amendments were enacted, those amendments had the effect of encouraging states to do two things, cut benefits, increase revenue by some benchmark in order to get forgiveness on uh, other penalties and charges. For example, 
uh, Congress reduced interest rates for those states that met these uh, uh, benchmarks and had, had uh, as I said, both raised revenue and cut benefits. Now, the states re responded uh, rather strongly, I think. First of all, they repaid their loans to the extent they could. Uh, the uh, repayments went from $362 million in 1982 to $2.6 billion the following year. Now, if you look back at our line graph, in 1983, that, mean that means that states repaid about $2.6 billion as the economy was coming out of a recession. Uh, that is, states had to cut benefits and raise taxes while unemployment was still high and while employers were still trying to recover from the uh, recession. Uh, that's the consequence of not having adequate reserves going into recession. It means that when you most need the countercyclical impact and the income support from this program, uh, the money isn't there and states have to uh, uh, go into uh, uh, sometimes draconian measures in order to be able to repay their loans. Uh, finally, they reacted by cutting benefits, and let, let me just give you a few examples. Uh, seven states reduced the maximum duration of benefits during the 1980s. Eighteen states tightened earnings requirements, that is, you had to earn more or for a longer period of time in order to uh, be eligible for benefits. Thirty-one states increased penalties for those who quit or were fired for misconduct. Now, those penalties uh, are... Uh, a part of the uh, basic structure of the unemployment insurance uh, law at the federal level. They are common in every state, but uh, the fact is that uh, states made it a lot harder to earn benefits in the future if you had uh, been disqualified for some purpose. Overall, from 81 to 87, 44 states, 30 of which had borrowed at some time during the 1980s, took action to cut benefits during that time period. Um, a recent study by Mathematica attributes perhaps 30 or 40 percent of the uh, of benefit cuts in the uh, 10 states that they study to uh, administrative or legislative changes at the state level so that uh, the, uh, the policy, ch policy changes, we think, very definitely had an effect on the level of benefits uh, provided by this program. Uh, Overall, our conclusion is that federal loan policies have not resulted in states accumulating reserves sufficient to withstand another recession without substantial borrowing. During future recessions, states may respond in a similar manner by reducing benefit eligibility if the system is not changed. Congress could reestablish the system's self-financing feature by providing states incentives to build adequate reserves during periods of low unemployment so that they wouldn't have to rebuild reserves during periods of high unemployment. However, current federal policy has had the effect of encouraging a reduction or with withdrawal of benefits to many workers so that Congress may wish to craft any measure that it uh, makes to improve adequacy in a way which does not further erode benefit eligibility. Uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, a good option, perhaps the best option, uh, and one which is consistent with current program mechanisms would be to establish a standard for the level of reserves at the federal level. The implementation of such a standard could then include a grace period for compliance based on variations in states' current and historical economic conditions. For example, Texas is in pretty bad shape right now. You might want to have a grace period in which uh, uh, they could uh, uh, recover their reserves without uh, facing any kind of penalty. Um, we think the standard could be enforced using a mechanism analogous to the penalty tax currently leveled on employers in states with delinquent trust funds. That is, uh, raising uh, taxes in those states, you'd have a resulting uh, revenue increase which would then be deposited in that state's trust fund and so that over a period of time, uh, which uh, could be worked out uh, with the Labor Department, you could get these funds back to an adequate level. With, without some action like that, it's very likely that with the current level of reserves, which are much lower than they were when we went into uh, the 1980s, uh, or to the uh, period just before the 1980s, uh, you might see uh, a substantial um, increase in borrowing again, uh, perhaps as large as we saw during the 1980s. That uh, concludes my prepared statement, and uh, we'd be happy to ask or to answer any questions that uh, that uh, the chairman or right. uh, thank you, might Mr. Have. Gaynor. Uh, you said that the uh, the reserves are not adequate. What what uh, would be your definition of adequate? Well, uh, the definition that we used in these calculations 
was the uh, reserves adequate in any given state, adequate to pay uh, benefits of a recessionary level, that's when unemployment is high, for one and a half years? We have uh, 20, a little better than $23 billion in the fund now, which is higher than it's, maybe than it's ever been, but it's just not adequate for some states, is that? It's not adequate for some states. I believe yours uh, has uh, uh, reserves that would be very close to what we would consider adequate for uh, uh, paying recession level benefits given the structure in your state. Uh, but there are a large number of states that have uh, very small reserves. I think uh, I counted about 10 last night that have reserves uh, which uh, calculate out to a high cost multiple of less than 0.3, which would be just a couple of months of recession level benefits before they had to borrow. And what you have is an uptick in, uh, in uh, benefits for a period that usually lasts longer than the recession uh, itself. Because now, now there, there are four funds in the country that are adequate to pay benefits of one and a half years, is that right? That's correct. At, at a recession level uh, payout. That's correct, sir. You used the term insolvent. What, what did you mean by insolvent? And does that mean they're borrowing or, or it, is it that means, your? It means that the uh, trust fund uh, balance uh, at the end of the year after repayments that are made during the uh, year is still negative. Would you say that one more time? Uh, Charlie, why don't you yeah. uh, okay. explain? Yes. Uh, the way we defined insolvency was that uh, looking at the, the net reserves of, of a trust fund at the end of the year, and at that time, if the reserves on hand were less than the outstanding loans, we classify that state as insolvent. So, one, so it's possible some states could have some reserves, but the amount of loans that they would owe to the federal unemployment account would be greater than, uh, than that, those available reserves. And 31 states are insolvent now, is that right? Uh, uh, no, sir. Uh, 31 states, by our definition, have been insolvent at some time since 1972. Uh, a number of those, it's important to keep in mind, though, that a number of those states uh, really experienced periods of chronic insolvency. We're insolvent for many of those years. So, uh, but that's, at this time, in 1986, we classified eight states as insolvent. In 1987, at this, well, as of January 1988, we classified one state as being insolvent. So insolvency, uh, the number of insolvent states has declined considerably over the last few years. One state's insolvent. How many are borrowing now? Uh, at, when we looked at the data in 19, uh, at, using January 1988 data, we had three states which uh, were still had, had outstanding loans. Uh, my understanding now is that Department of Labor says that there are only two states which are, have been borrowed during this year, or have outstanding loans during 1988. And by your definition of uh, the the ability to pay uh, one and a half years at the recession level uh, economy, uh, what, at what level could we pay now from the total fund? For how long a period of time could we pay? On average, you'd, you, our, our estimate is about eight months. Now, some states would, would have uh, virtually no uh, reserves. Uh, they couldn't pay uh, a month without borrowing. Others have uh, significant reserves and could pay perhaps for uh, two years. But on average, you're looking at about eight months. And if you compare that eight months to what we had going into 1971, um, at that point, we had enough uh, reserves to pay for perhaps uh, uh, 13 or 14 months. And yet, um, the uh, recession that began in 1971 uh, eliminated, eliminated those reserves, and they've never recovered uh, since that period. So if we have $23 billion now, and that carries us eight months, in order to get to the 1.5, we would need somewhere around $40 billion in the... Uh, That's correct, sir. Mm -hmm. A lot of that, uh, are your projections based upon the current uh, state uh, payout uh, benefit uh, policies? Well, um, 
The um, are, are are they based on this uh, the standard that uh, you may uh, they're, no they're they're like based on two things they're based on um, historic high payout levels for each state and their current benefit payment rates. Otherwise, their current policy current, for benefits. Current policy. Yeah. In your judgment, was that uh, there was some discrepancy in those uh, those uh, payout benefits? Of course, and in your judgment, that needs to be standardized. That, is that part of was that part of your testimony as well? I'm sorry, I don't quite follow. That the pay that the the benefits from unemployment uh, insurance uh, needs to be standardized uh, across the country uh, and not. Uh, I, I actually didn't say that. We we. Uh, we didn't really look at that uh, question explicitly, uh, and I think that's a, really a matter of, of uh, the first federal and or uh, state policy. Mm -hmm. Under the current law, the states decide what the benefits are, and they decide what their tax rates are. As long as they tax at a certain level on a certain wage base, uh, they're free to set their tax and benefit levels. But some of those uh, states that are solvent, and you mentioned mine, and it apparently is solvent. I think we have enough under our present payout policy for about five years. In fact, uh, the representative from, from the Florida Unemployment Insurance Office uh, told me that uh, we could pay all 11 million citizens of Florida $163 uh, for five years. Uh, but I think maybe some of our benefits uh, are, are, are our benefits are not as great as some other, other states. Uh, you think, uh, in your judgment, uh, are some states too uh, uh, stingy or niggardly in their uh, responsibilities? I, I, and <clears throat> I could only offer a personal opinion on that, sir. And uh, uh, as I say, we didn't really study uh, uh, the adequacy of benefits. That's a, that's an entirely different subject. Uh, but mm -hmm. it what's is the average length of time that the worker draws benefits nationwide? Since we're talking about. Uh, it's um, country. Do you know the number offhand? It's it's something in the neighborhood of 12 weeks, I think. Uh, I'd have to check right now. It, it would vary by state, first of all, because uh, clearly there's considerable experience, uh, different experiences across states. Uh, I'd have to. Uh, I could get you the well, national do you, number. Do you know the typical length of time that a worker uh, uh, might draw benefits? Uh, well, sir, it would vary uh, depending, you know, on the, the general level of unemployment. Typically, during, during periods of high unemployment, ben, uh, empl unemployment spells and generally the duration of unemployment benefits gets longer. Uh, Fourteen and a half weeks. Thank you. The, uh, the maximum benefit in most states is about 26 weeks. So if a worker is, is uh, unemployed for that period of time and eligible based on their past earnings, they would get the 26 weeks. Um, but uh, typically they, they find a job before that What's period's What's the uh, total debt now to the fund? It must be less than so approximately $1.2 billion is my understanding, sir. Uh, there are two states and they owe $1.2 billion in debt to the federal unemployment account. I might say that, that uh, to get to the level of uh, reserves that we have now, it's taken the longest peacetime uh, expansion in this century. And at, at this time period uh, in an expansion, you'd expect the reserves to be much higher. And I would attribute the fact that they are not to the fact that um, uh, states have attempted to keep taxes low, or many states have attempted to keep taxes low. Uh, many states are still experiencing economic hard times, and uh, uh, generally the policy at the federal level with the backup loan capacity has encouraged states to, to the extent they can, uh, use the federal borrowing whenever it's available to them. Uh, for example, a state can um, uh, enter into debt early in the year and as long as it pays back by the end of the fiscal year, it's interest-free. At the same time, they can accrue reserves from uh, their uh, revenues and place those on uh, a deposit with the federal government and earn interest on it. So it's not, it's not a real even policy between uh, interest in one direction and interest in the other direction. So you have actually an encouragement now 
for a state, state that's close to uh, insolvency to remain in debt as long as it can, as long as it doesn't go over the end of its fiscal year. Thank you. Mr. Chase. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, in my um, 13 years in the state legislature, whenever this issue came up, basically if labor had a choice between um, accumulating reserves or increasing benefits, they chose to increase benefits. And if the employer had a choice of um, increasing the reserves uh, or keeping the tax down, they chose to keep the tax down. Basically, their position and fear was that um, uh, that labor would use the argument that the fund has lots in it, uh, and so therefore we can afford to increase the benefits. And so it seemed to me that there began to be an agreement, at least in my state, that there would be, uh, we would put a certain level of reserves in, but not get it so high that people would see this as a, a great fund to increase benefits. Um, given that kind of argument, how, what would be the response of the federal government to, to try to discourage both those viewpoints? Well, if, if you had a reserve standard at the federal level, um, in essence, uh, the requirement. State, yeah, if you had a requirement, state legislatures and, and the two uh, 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 opposite uh, factions that you mentioned, labor and employers, uh, couldn't make those kind of trade-offs. You'd, you'd sort of change the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. I, I missed the first part of your statement and tried to reread some of it um, while Congressman Grant was asking the questions. Uh, it, was there ever a time when we had uh, uh, a certain level of uh, reserves required on the part of the states? Um, as far as I know, there's never been a uh, specific requirement. In the early, uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, 1981, uh, labor uh, I think responding to a National Commission on Unemployment uh, Compensation um, set a, uh, a voluntary standard of uh, 1.5, which is the one we used for our analysis. Um, prior to that time, uh, the feeling, I think, among uh, state unemployment uh, compensation officials, sort of the traditional measure was um, a high cost multiple of three which would mean recession level benefits uh, adequate to pay for uh, pay benefits for uh, three years. Uh, there's never been any complete agreement on what adequate reserves are. Um, it, um, it probably varies somewhat from state to state, but I think you're really talking about kind of an arbitrary rule um, which would uh, get closer to the self-financing concept uh, I don't think it would be desirable uh, to hold reserves so that states uh, never had to borrow. The borrowing mechanism is sensible. Uh, I don't think you want to tie up too much of the economy's uh, capital in reserves, but uh, in our judgment, the amount in the reserves now is, is inadequate to, uh, let's say, continue uh, sort of the level of benefits that you have in this program. Uh, there's just too much pressure now. Uh, uh, with interstate competition, uh, there's too much pressure to keep taxes down, and there's uh, too much pressure to reduce benefits in order to avoid uh, federal borrowing uh, penalties. So that the, I'd say the system is uh, is uh, still uh, healthy in a certain sense, but it's a little out of balance, and you do get some negative impacts then when you go into a recession, uh, both in terms of cost to the federal government and in terms of reduced benefits for uh, those who are unemployed. And the idea of this program is to spread the cost of unemployment to those who are working. And I don't think uh, it is envisioned that uh, you can, would continually cut benefits and uh, put the uh, cost more and more on those who are unemployed. What I find so unsettling about your comments is that since we have borrowed so much in the past, uh, when we had a more adequate reserves, and now you're saying we even have less, there's no one who doesn't anticipate sometime we will have a recession. And you, when you couple that with uh, our failure, uh, both the executive and legislative branch, to deal with the deficit and the fact that the debt is seven years ago less than a trillion, now I'm talking about the national debt, and now 2.7 trillion, when you couple that all up, you, I'm struck with the fact that we have become a very selfish society. I mean, we are just not anticipating at all for this future problem. 
So I, I'm, I'm happy that we are taking testimony from you today. Yeah, you can't predict the future, but um, if the past is any indicator, and if, if the current level of reserves is any indicator, and I should say we don't believe that you'll get adequate reserves, even if this expansion continues well into the 1990s, you'll still have some states that are in pretty good shape given their, their uh, tax and benefit structure. But overall, uh, you won't see a, a, uh, an aggregate uh, adequacy in this system until well into the 1990s, even if uh, we don't see any uh, downturn in the economy between now and then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. One, one other question before the Council uh, ask a few. Uh, are, are the extended benefits covered now? You, you mentioned that one of the reasons for the, uh, for the downturn was uh, the payout of extended benefits. As, they, it, as far as I know, they're still not funded by any state in a formal way. No. No. Uh, in, in compiling your, uh, your projections, did you take into account the, uh, the, the various requirements of certain states? For example, in Florida, we have a 5.3 percent unemployment rate. Uh, we think that uh, unemployment payout uh, may be skewed a little higher than we would uh, ordinarily think because of the large number of second source incomes in Florida. Twenty percent of our population is over retirement age. Uh, those, most of those people who do work have second source income, which of course is a federal requirement that they can't receive unemployment benefits if they have second source income and uh, our pensions. Uh, and also by the large number of migrant workers in Florida in agriculture, uh, many of whom uh, may stay there for a while after a particular crop is harvested before they move on up the country, which is typical, and then they might otherwise be eligible for unemployment, but under Florida rules don't, uh, don't measure up. Uh, did you factor those, consider those kinds of considerations in your projections of the uh, inadequacy of the fund? Um, well, you do in a certain sense. You look at what the what past benefit payouts have been. That is, you look at, at the state's experience given the nature of its economy, and you uh, compare that to uh, the amount of reserves that uh, that the state has. So it's 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 uh, handled implicitly. Um, but I think <clears throat> a sort of a related point is that. It, the, the structure of the economy has changed, so the demographics of the workforce has changed considerably, and that has uh, impacted the recipiency, um, and that's sometimes used as an explanation for why uh, you shouldn't worry about the reduction in the recipiency rate, but the economy is going much more and more to a point where it depends upon uh, uh, part-time and part-year employees. Uh, that's uh, given the changes in the economy, the shakeout that we've had from the uh, two recessions in the 1980s, you've restructured to the point where we depend upon those people. And uh, they, uh, they very often uh, need something to get them on to the next job. So I, uh, our judgment would be that the, uh, the recipiency rate does make a difference in terms of, um, let's say, uh, the overall level of poverty uh, that we're experiencing today. That's probably uh, some impact there. And um, you've had uh, a reduction, a general reduction in people's ability to get on to the next job without significant loss of their assets and, uh, and uh, their, their uh, uh, ability to live comfortably. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Counselor. Mr. Gaynor, there's some people who might say, what's the big deal? The federal government runs on deficit financing. What's wrong with massive borrowing by the states? How would you or Mr. Jessick respond to those people? Um, well, uh, I'll admit that it's a little bit of a complex argument. Uh, with, with the amount of money that's borrowed for this purpose and, uh, and that purpose, uh, I think you could easily dismiss this problem and say that the system works. Uh, that everybody gets benefits. But if you look at it more carefully, there are, there are a number of cross currents here. <clears throat> First of all, when the federal borrowing goes up, it does, uh, it does increase uh, the borrowing at the federal level. And we have this implicit subsidy since interest is not paid until the second fiscal year in which you have debt. Uh, we, don't, we didn't estimate it. To, it's fairly complex to do it. But, but I would guess that, that the, uh, the the federal borrowing 
uh, in the 1980s may have cost the federal government in those implicit subsidies something between 75 and 100 million dollars. So there's a cost associated with this insolvency. Second, um, you, you end up, if you don't have reserves going into a recession, you end up building your reserves as you come out of the recession when unemployment is high and when employers are least capable of paying uh, uh, higher taxes. So you're getting a pro-cyclical rather than a counter-cyclical impact uh, when re the reserves are not adequate. Uh, you're also getting an encouragement here to interstate competition in a state that's in particularly bad shape with, it re with its reserves uh, and would like to uh, uh, build its reserves back for the next recession has to be mindful of states that have not uh, uh, had the same kind of uh, impact on their economy and who are in better shape to keep their employer taxes down. So you're getting that kind of interstate uh, competition, which is probably very detrimental to the ultimate beneficiaries of the program because if taxes are kept down, benefits have to be reduced in those states that are having uh, particularly high unemployment rates. So you end up uh, hurting the workers that are supposed to be the ultimate beneficiaries of this program. So if you follow that argument through, I think uh, you can see that both from a federal fiscal point of view and from the point of view of, of uh, accomplishing the basic purposes of this program, that is, uh, wage continuity for workers and countercyclical stimulus to the economy, um, low reserves leading to uh, insolvency and borrowing uh, work against the basic purpose of the program. Okay. In its testimony, the Department of Labor states that a standard for adequate state reserves is not needed. Why does GAO believe such a standard is necessary? Um, well, I guess it's related to, to uh, to the line of argument I just used, uh, with, uh, with the states um, find it ne finding it necessary to compete for businesses, they'd like to keep their taxes down. And that means a decrease in benefits uh, over the long term. It may not mean it next year, but as we've seen in the 80s, over time these benefits have been reduced under the program, and they're on a long-term uh, downward trend. And I think a lot of that has to do with this fiscal stringency that these state funds have been going through. So without a federal standard, I think you can expect this same pattern to go on well into the future. Anytime there's an uptick in unemployment, you're going to see this borrowing, and it's very likely without some change in federal policy that that'll be an encouragement to further cut benefits. Okay, one final question. Some states have recently repaid their federal unemployment insurance loans with revenue obtained from the issuance of tax-exempt state bonds. What's your view of this practice and its implications for the UI system? Uh, uh, Mr. Nilsson has looked at that uh, issue. Why don't you? Uh, the use of uh, state tax-free bonds to pay back loans uh, basically is um, related to the same kind of problem. That is, states are needing to raise taxes in order to pay off their loans and as a result, they're trying to uh, limit the increases in their, their outflow of funds by cutting benefits. Um, <coughs> by floating a tax-free bond, the state, in a sense, uh, saves a little money uh, because the interest rate on these are somewhat lower, but at the same time, they're receiving a, a federal subsidy because they are tax-free. Um, but at the same time, um, what the states have done in order to pay off these bonds is add another employer tax to um, fund these bonds. Um, these bonds generally have a longer payoff period than the federal loan so that this employer tax is on employers for longer. Uh, if we run into a recession, um, this tax is still going to be on employers. Um, we're going to need to raise um, revenue or a state is going to be faced with pressures to raise revenue in order to pay benefits and employers again are going to be faced with higher taxes as uh, Mr. Gaynor said per exactly at the time um, y you want to um, keep costs low on employers to help them um, uh, help them out of the recession uh, so that there is there are the problems associated with the pro-cyclical nature of the, pro of, uh, of the issue and also, there is still an incentive uh, for states to cut benefits in order to save additional money. Thank you. At the peak of the last recession, how many states had borrowed from the trust fund? 
I think it was uh, 22 or 23. 23. Mm -hmm. 23. 23. And what again was the total debt then? Uh, what was the highest debt that? Well, of the 30 million uh, that's been borrowed in the. Uh, uh, since 1970, over half of that, we estimate, has been borrowed since 1980. I believe the figure is close to two-thirds of that. So uh, that was borrowed during the, the two recessions that occurred in the 80s. But at the, we, at the, at the 23 states uh, at the peak of the last recession, at the 23 states at the peak of the last recession had borrowed from the trust fund, it was totaled somewhere around $20 billion in is, is that, did you I'd say, say that? That's about right. That, that would, would not all have been in, in the same year, however. Uh, we, we can uh, look that number up. I know we have it and provide it to you for the record. Okay. I'm just trying to get at where we are. And the total debt now, you said, was one, roughly one and a half billion, was it? 1.2. 1.2 billion. Well, that's a reduction in debt of, uh, at, assuming that it was 20 billion, that's $18.8 billion in reduced indebtedness. Uh, over the last uh, 13, 13 or so years, where we're 13 years, is it, is it correct in itself? I, I don't. Qu no, what's happening is, in general, as states are paying off their their uh, debt, they are reducing taxes. They feel they've solved their problem, and they're not because they're not encouraged to build reserves. They're cutting their taxes so that then reserves are not being built up. Mm -hmm. Is your definition of a federal standard really a call for a reduction in the benefits by some states? Well, actually, uh, um, what we said uh, in the report that we're uh, about to publish is that uh, from uh, the point of view of uh, sort of uh, fiscal integrity, um, the funds ought to carry uh, adequate reserves. And those reserves ought to be there so that you you get a count, counter cyclical impact from the program. But that uh, any measure to improve adequacy is likely uh, to again result in a cut in benefits. So we raise it as a matter of consideration for the Congress that if uh, if they do something with the uh, with the uh, adequacy standard, uh, they they might want to. Uh, put in something to see that benefits are not further eroded because that would be the likely outcome from mm -hmm. uh, uh, putting pressure on the adequacy side. Yeah, anything else? Thank you very much. Been very Thank helpful. you, sir. Our next witness is uh, Carolyn Golding, Deputy Administrator of the Office of Employment Security, uh, Employment Training Administration of the Department of Labor. Accompanying her will be uh, Marianne Warsh, Warsh. Warsh, pardon me, Warsh, Director of Unemployment Insurance Services, and James Manning, Chief of the Division of Actuarial Services. Uh, Ms. Golding, we have your testimony. We'll enter it into uh, the record, and you may proceed as uh, you wish. Okay, thank you. Um, we very much appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to uh, present the Department of Labor's views on the General Accounting Office's draft report on UI financing. Um, you've already uh, met the people who are with me and who I will turn to uh, probably during the question period uh, to help me answer any questions that you might have. Um, I would like to highlight uh, some points in my testimony, which I think go to some of the questions that uh, you and your colleagues were asking. Um, our testimony, um, as you have it, addresses the two questions that you posed to us in your letter of invitation. You asked for the Department's evaluation of, of state's general capacity to rebuild reserves and at the same time pay benefits at the point at which we are now. Um, and with the state of current law. And then you asked us for our recommendations, if any, on stabilizing um, UI trust funds in the states. Um, before I go into our evaluation, let me give you some background, which I think is important. Uh, I think we need to talk about how we got to where we are today. Uh, I think past history does illuminate um, today's circumstances. Um, 
first and, and an important element that I think Mr. Gaynor alluded to is the respective state and federal roles as, as they exist today in current law in um, establishing state trust fund levels. Basically, the states have wide discretion within a, a framework of federal law uh, to structure their UI programs on both the benefit side and the tax structure side. They set uh, benefit levels, they set the durations uh, for which people can draw benefits, and um, they set the eligibility conditions. Um, they also, on the other side of the equation, design the tax structure to support that benefit payment system, and they set the tax rates, usually annually, uh, based on their own assessment of where their reserves are. And um, I think I would disagree with something that Mr. Uh, Gaynor said. There is more indexing, I think, than his remarks uh, recognized. Uh, there is indexing um, that does cover now uh, the expenditures for uh, extended benefits, and it does cover, it does look back to the most recent historical outlay experience. And of course, states collect the taxes and pay the benefits um, that are supported by those taxes. The federal role in state financing is fairly narrow. Uh, basically, we make sure that the funds that are deposited in the trust fund are used exclusively for benefits. They're totally dedicated for that purpose. And we provide advances to states under the authority of the Social Security Act if and when state trust funds are exhausted. We do require, um, since the early 80s, that they repay those advances with interest. And we oversee the repayment to make sure that it's accomplished on time, if not, uh, that the penalties are invoked. Um, a second element in the background of how we got to where we are, I think, is the UI countercyclical design that Mr. Gaynor did refer to. Um, it's one uh, that was in the design, the earliest design of the UI program. And as it has acted historically over the years, it has worked to replenish state trust funds in recovery periods for outlays in, in the preceding recession. And it's worked generally on a three-year basis. Um, most states gear their tax structures to return in a three-year period the outlays of the prior three years. Now, that three-year period has worked in, um, in the United States economy because recessions in states and in the national economy generally, historically, have lasted about 18 months. Um, so there is a little overlap uh, at the end of a recessionary period as you go into the beginning of a recovery period when pa taxes start escalating while benefits are still high. But that three-year cycle um, has generally worked. And the design that states have, have used building that historical precedent has worked. Um, the third element, though, is, is recent history and some things that happened um, that I think had a lot of influence on disrupting that three-year cycle recently and on getting us to where we are today. Um, one of the things Mr. Gain, Gainer mentioned, and that is the back-to-back -back recessions in the 1980 um, to 83 period, uh, the second recession started before there was a chance for a three-year replenishment cycle um, to replace trust fund revenues in most states. Second, it followed close on the heels of some experience of the mid to late 70s. Um, he alluded to, and the chart shows, um, the impact of the recession of, of 75, 76, which caused um, some significant borrowing, the first significant borrowing, although the loan fund had existed um, with one two-year gap since 1944. Um, and it also led to the circumstances um, that existed in 1980. In fact, that borrowing was not repaid before the recession started in 18. 1980. Why? Um, the loans were not repaid because um, the statutory loan recapture and repayment provisions were suspended. They were suspended by law for the whole period of 75 to 79. Um, there were sanctions on the books and uh, repayment penalties, but they were not uh, permitted to kick in. The intent of suspending those sanctions and penalties was, I think, to ease the repayment burden on states who were thought to be facing a, a benefits, uh, a heavy benefits cost period. In fact, um, the heavy benefits cost period was confined to a relatively small portion of the time for which the suspension was granted. And so the real effect was quite different from the intended <coughs> one. Most states accepted the deferral 
um, and even hoped for forgiveness of the total loan amount and made no efforts to repay the total um, and avoided or deferred uh, their decisions about solvency and repayment. The bottom line was most states from 75 to 79 failed to bolster their funds in the way that we would have expected. So when the economy dipped in 80-81, um, the practical effect was that states had to begin to repay the loans at the same time that benefit costs accelerated and they were doing it without um, adequate reserves. The Congress recognized uh, the difficulty of that situation and recognized um, that significant action was required and the actions that, um, that the uh, uh, previous witnesses um, have identified were taken. Um, in addition to um, ending the suspension of the, of the statutory provisions that were on the books, the Congress instituted the payment of interest on, on outstanding loan balances, and they added some positive incentives, um, a reduction or deferral of interest costs to states which improved their solvency, provided that they did two things in improving their solvency. They had to make, take significant actions that met um, statutory percentage thresholds, and they had to take them under the terms of the Social Security Act amendments of 83. They had to take them on both the benefit side and the revenue side. In other words, had to be a balanced approach on both sides of the equation. The states did respond um, to those congressional actions, and they have um, done a number of things, some of which um, I've supplied in uh, my written testimony and that GAO also included in its testimony, so I won't, won't list those now. Um, the result is uh, states have repaid all but a billion, two hundred million of the peak debt um, of 14 billion that we reached in, in 1984. Uh, that was the peak debt to the federal loan fund. And their repayment reflects not just um, the working of the incentives and the interest payment on the loan fund, but I think uh, a recognition of states uh, that this was a responsibility that they had and a strong commitment on the part of states and their employers and worker groups uh, to returning state funds to solvency. Uh, with that background, I would say that, that our evaluation is, is somewhat rosier uh, than the GAO. I think, we think today that the trust funds are reasonably sound in most cases. Uh, the trust fund balances as of March 88 are just under $24 billion. Um, and they are better in most states um, than the picture in 1979, um, which is the most recent prior recovery period and the period that I just mentioned, uh, which was uh, at the end of the suspension of the, uh, uh, the loan uh, prov penalty provisions. As of December 31st of uh, 1987, 36 states had balances of 18 months or more at the current rate of expenditure, and four more states had 12 months or more balances uh, at the current rate of expenditure. Now, having said that, and having said that we think they're reasonably sound in most cases, does not mean that we feel that we should be complacent about the situation. There are problems. Um, the two states that were mentioned, Pennsylvania and Michigan, are still in debt. Uh, although they have sufficient money in their trust funds, uh, even before the big deposits of, of April, May, uh, to repay the debt that they owe us. Um, Nine more states, in addition to those two, have less than an eight months balance uh, at the current rate of expenditure in their trust funds. And you know, those are problem areas. Um, before dealing with, with our recommendations and with the GAO recommendations, I would like to say a little bit about what the Department of Labor is doing and about a recent law change that, um, that we have not yet discussed. Um, first of all, as, as um, the GAO witnesses, mentioned, we do encourage states to maintain reserves of as much as um, 18 times the one-month high-cost multiple or one-and-a-half times the annual high-cost multiple. Um, most states have not reached that level, a few have. Uh, Florida approaches it and a few others. Um, we encourage it. It is not mandatory. Uh, we continue to encourage it. We provide a lot of technical assistance and training to the state people who are involved in designing and maintaining their tax and benefit structures. Um, we have, as an example, um, an automated um, 
econometric type model that we call the, the state benefit financing model that will model the impact of a state's law in alternative economic scenarios or alternatively uh, assess the impact of proposed state law changes in uh, future recessions uh, should they resemble the ones that we've seen in the past. And uh, 30 states have taken advantage of the use of that model uh, to assess the impact of state law changes or to assess the impact of, of recessions on their current state law. We also um, train a substantial number of state professional and technical staff in forecasting and actuarial techniques to strengthen their, their in-house capacity um, uh, to do their own forecasting. Um, we've trained um, somewhere between two and three hundred state staff in those techniques and we continue to offer that training. We're offering an, another session next month. We also do a lot of one-on-one of -on -one assistance at the request of states, sometimes with state legislatures as they review their current state law structures. Um, recent examples are, are uh, Louisiana and Texas, which uh, have been badly hit by the oil and gas um, recession, and the state of Alabama. We also develop and publish a lot of, of information about um, the state trust fund situation, tax structures, and benefit structures. Um, we have developed an overall model which forecasts uh, what's likely to happen uh, to the UI trust fund generally given um, the Council of Economic Advisors forecasts, and we update that forecast three times a year. It was basically that model that GAO used to do a lot of its work. Um, we also publish a lot of other solvency-related data, including experience rating data, um, which is the, the tool that's required in the Social Security Act as a basis for uh, employer <coughs> UI taxes in states. And we publish a lot of other information on um, features of state taxation and tax structures. Um, a recent law change that I think bears a lot on the subject that we've been talking about uh, was incorporated in the Omnibus Reconciliation Act changes of 1987. Um, the, that provision, among many other things, uh, extended the two-tenths temporary surtax um, that's collected under uh, the Federal Unemployment Tax Act on employers. Um, and it directed that half of that extra two-tenths tax be deposited directly to the loan fund that grants loans to state trust funds when they run out of resources. And it went further, it quintupled the ceiling in that account. Since that fund was established in 1944, it's had a very low ceiling, so it has not accumulated any reserves. The result is when states borrowed, um, the Treasury and the Department turned right around and borrowed from general revenue. Uh, now, uh, given this much higher ceiling and direct and accelerated revenue deposits, we don't see that happening um, in the future. The, the extra direct deposit is going to accelerate deposits to that fund. Uh, it will add over $2 billion in the next three years. We're expecting the fund to reach um, $5.5 billion by 1991, and the ceiling um, increases as covered employment and covered wages increase. So it's indexed to what's happening in the economy. And it should mean um, that we don't add to federal debt. Uh, we should be building up a reserve to feed uh, the loan system. And I think that's a very important improvement um, to the protection for the system as a whole. Um, as to recommendations, um, we oppose um, a federal solvency standard um, suggested, as suggested by GAO for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, it, it is a major change um, to what has been the federal state balance in responsibilities that has worked over 50 plus years. We believe that the key benefits and tax structure decisions need to be made at the state level. Uh, they know most about their own state industrial mix, their own state economic growth policies, their own state tax structure, their own average wage, um, and their own growth picture. Um, it's very difficult. Um, to assess all those kinds of things on behalf of 53 separate UI systems at a much more remote federal level. Uh, we can do uh, national modeling based on past experience, but it's very difficult to take that model down and make it work in 53 environments. Um, setting that standard could 
also get us into precisely the point um, that I think the GAO witnesses were making, and that is you could run the risk of getting into pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical action. Uh, be very easy to do. Um, we would prefer to stay with the kind of look back three year replenishment period that we think has generally worked in UI. Um, it also takes us um, into a major federal intervention in state decisions, difficult ones, about the trade off um, between building up UI reserves versus keeping money in the state economy um, for um, economic growth and job expansion. I think also um, that GAO oversimplifies the task of, of setting up a, a federal standard. And um, the National Commission on Unemployment Compensation, which uh, was a blue ribbon commission that finished its work in 1980, said something that I'd like to quote that I think is very important. Um, this was a commission made up of labor and employer um, and um, academics and public representatives who looked at the UI system for um, a two to three year period. And they said, the difficulty with a federal uniform standard lies in developing one that is effective and equitable among states. To take into account state differences in UI program structure, industrial mix, seasonality, and economic growth would be extremely difficult um, and would probably result in a standard that is very complex. Uh, Excuse me, Golden, can I just yeah. interrupt you for one second? Sure. It's my understanding that the Commission continues and says that in spite of the difficulty, DOL should try to develop standards. Isn't that correct? Yes. And we did look at it and... So aren't you selectively quoting their conclusions by I the think passage you just read right now? I'm not trying to be selective. I'm trying to point out the degree of difficulty, technical difficulty. And I think a complex standard and a technically difficult one um, is one that runs the risk of um, doing what we saw in 75 to 79, and that is an action with a good intention um, produces a perverse consequence that runs actually counter to the intent of what you're trying to do. But the Commission recognizes the difficulty, but nevertheless, they suggest that DOL should try to develop standards. Explore it, okay. I think, is a, is a fair way. Study the option. Ms. Worsh corrects me. Um, I think even if you could develop it, setting aside the complexity, uh, I think it would be extremely difficult to apply and to administer. Um, for example, I think everybody would agree you don't want the standard to apply during a recessionary period. In other words, you don't want if you used something like, um, like the GAO proposal or what GAO used as a solvency measure, one and a half times the high cost multiple. I think everyone would agree that you don't want it to apply in a recession. We're not in a recession now, so it should apply, I think, would be the general gist of it. On the other hand, we have Louisiana and Texas. I think they would argue they're in a recessionary period. I use that as an example because um, a lot of times we don't know until uh, three to six months after the fact that we've started the downslope into a recessionary period. The economic indicators sometimes lag in telling us where we are. Um, so applying a standard can be very difficult um, and could get you into the, into the position of perverse consequences and back into the pro-cyclical position rather than counter-cyclical. I think it, it's also difficult to craft a sanction. Um, what's going to be the penalty for not having an adequate reserve once you judge uh, that a state has failed to meet your standard? Um, the sanction um, can be very difficult to apply to and can also introduce another round of perverse consequences. Now, so those are among the reasons that we have uh, in the department for opposing a federal solvency standard. I think, um, you know, having said that, I think that GAO's study does a lot uh, to escalate the importance of this subject in everyone's eyes and I welcome the report and its timing. Um, and one of the things that, that we plan to do once the report is final is to make sure that states have it and to reemphasize our guidance on the subject. And in the department, we will continue to use the tools that we have, refine them to make them work better, and explore um, new tools to see what we can do um, to improve the general solvency situation. Uh, with that, I'll await any questions that you might have. 
What, what, in your judgment, then, should we be doing to help those uh, few troubled states, uh, Texas, Louisiana, you mentioned uh, specifically, and maybe Alabama, uh, who, uh, who are experiencing recession now? Um, I think what, what you can do is to make sure that they have um, information available about what other states who've been similarly situated have done to extricate themselves from that situation and to examine their law in detail to make sure that it isn't, um, it doesn't have glitches in it uh, that run counter to what it is they need to accomplish, which is a return to solvency. Um, what I don't think you can do is intervene in the, in the judgment process of the state legislature, employers and workers in you can't substitute, I think, a federal judgment for theirs about what's appropriate for their circumstance. But do you do make the loans available? Of course, you continue to do that. Oh, we do, do make that, the loans yeah. available, and I think we should continue mm -hmm. to do so. And then it would be up to the individual state. They could uh, use their own uh, judgment as to uh, the, the kind of uh, increase or decrease in, uh, in benefits or uh, the, the contributions to the, uh, to the trust fund, et cetera. Is it, it, and, and other decisions, yeah. too. I think um, the degree to which they um, assess costs against, uh, against the employers who, who have the, the highest uh, amounts of turnover, how they balance their tax structure from top to bottom, from the high tax employers to the low tax, um, how much, um, how quickly they collect for employers such as uh, nonprofit agencies and state and local government who pay only after the fact. They don't contribute in advance um, the way private employers do, private for profit employers do to tax reserves. I mean, there are lots of things they can do to accelerate um, or to change the structure of their, of their tax. But you table. give the states options, do you not? Uh, we do. Uh, and you monitor them closely so that if you see a particular state uh, is about to, in your judgment, experience uh, some difficulties, uh, you do s offer suggestions. Do yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Just uh, for my benefit, what kind of interest uh, rates do states have to pay when they borrow from the, from the uh, it, it, uh, it floats. It's capped at 10 percent, and it is um, related to the latest rate of interest that Treasury is paying on its long-term borrowing earning on, and earning on its um, assets. What's the latest, Jim? Uh, the latest is uh, about 9 percent. I think mm -hmm. it's slightly under that. And you set the rate? Treasury. No, Treasury does. Tre uh, pardon me? The Department of Treasury, Treasury sets it. Treasury does. Uh -huh. You have some questions? Yes. Ms. Golding, the, there are two primary objectives, objectives to the unemployment insurance system. One, to help stabilize the economy during recessions and economic downturns. The other, to provide income maintenance while the jobless seek new employment. States apparently are not maintaining reserves for tough times, and the safety net is down. 31.5% uh, of the unemployed are not only 31.5% of the unemployed are receiving UI benefits, the lowest on record. Is the system working? I think it is. Um, the, um, we've spent a lot of um, time recently and effort looking at the proportion of unemployed uh, currently drawing benefits. Um, and I, I would not disagree with the kind of the general three factors that, that GAO outlined. I would say a couple of things, though, that a recent study by Mathematic on this subject has, has shown us. Um, first of all, um, UI pays recent job losers. In other words, people whose job experience is remote, new entrants to the labor force or re-entrants after, after a period of being out of the labor force, aren't covered by UI. And, and uh, were never anticipated to be. And they are a more significant part of the people who show up in the total unemployed population than they were in, say, the 70s, um, and certainly the 60s. Um, some of the people who leave their jobs uh, leave them for a variety of reasons um, that have nothing to do with involuntary job loss, which is what UI was set up to compensate. They leave voluntarily for a number of reasons. Um, and those people, generally speaking, are either not covered or have a substantial disqualification period that they have to work off. Uh, when you add 
re-entrance, new entrance, and um, voluntary um, departers from jobs and people who are self-employed, uh, you end up excluding a substantial portion of the unemployed. How does that compare to the percentage that are excluded because of tightened eligibility requirements? Um, I would say that job losers are, or in, I'm looking at some numbers now which go back to October 87. Um, I just picked these up as I was leaving the office. Um, about, we were in, in October, about 26% of the people um, who were, 27% um, were claiming UI benefits. An additional 8% um, of those or so um, had exhausted uh, UI benefits, had been unemployed uh, for 26 weeks or longer. Um, about another 8, 5 perhaps to 8% um, in that context might have been able um, to qualify for UI benefits before the early 80s. However, it's hard to tell because they weren't people who came in the door and asked for benefits and were denied. Um, it is true that state qualifications were tightened up in the early 80s. Some of those paralleled changes that the federal government made in the extended benefits program, for example, uh, periods of, of qualification. Um, but the Mathematica study tells us that it's not necessarily a straight line equation. Okay. What is an adequate level of reserves for a state to meet a recession? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Do you have any, uh, any idea? Any well, we like our guidance that at the beginning of the recession, the ideal situation right. would be to have one and a half times the high cost multiple. Um, we think that's a good um, rule of thumb for a state to use. And that was the guideline in 1981. That was, was the guideline it? that we continue to maintain that we issued in 1981. And according to GAO, only four states can withstand a recession using that figure. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, and yet you say that the trust fund is reasonably sound in most states. How would you distinguish those two scenarios? Well, um, I don't, we, we are not forecasting that we're at the point of entering a recession. And um, when we said that we thought a state ought to have as much as a one and a half times the high cost multiple, we were saying that they ought to be ready with that money at the onset of a recession. We don't see that we're facing a recession at this point. We see that we will have um, some months, um, based on the Council of Economic Advisors forecast, to continue to boost the reserves. And in fact, uh, a substantial amount has been done since 84. When you look at the debt reduction as well as um, the reserve boost. When you say in your, you know, in your testimony, as to an economic downturn that you do not predict that is probable. Who is the we? Is that the Labor Department? Is that Alan Greenspan? Is that the White House astrologer? Who is the we? The Council of Economic Council of Advisors. Economic, sorry. We okay. always use their forecasts as the basis for ours. With regard to setting a standard, I recognize that states are different, but is it not possible to provide a sort of menu where a state can do X Y or Z, but a state has to do one of them to meet the needs of the various states. Is that something that you are considering or should be considering? We, uh, we've looked at a number of different things. I think the reserve multiple is the one that we're most interested in and think uh, as a guideline has some merit to it. We did want to get some outside help on this, and we contracted to get a study from uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Roman and Barno uh, that was published in December of 1986, and we circulated that to the states for their assistance and guidance. Their general results with that were that uh, it's a very complex 
uh, problem, that uh, there is no simple solution that goes across state lines, that uh, you need to consider the uh, rapidity of being able to generate uh, taxes in some states against a bigger trust fund than others, and they had no real direct one solution or even a menu, as you suggest. We have a vote on now. Uh, we'll continue as soon as we get back from the vote. Hearing what convene, I apologize. We all apologize. Uh, there has been unexpected events, as you know, which uh, impinge on our ability to do things. And uh, we will continue. I believe the staff director was questioning the witnesses, and we'll continue with Mr. Weisberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Goulding, what's the department's policy concerning states using taxes and bonds to repay the federal unemployment insurance loan debt? Um, we don't have a policy uh, that says that's a good thing or a bad thing. What do you think? Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's something that states have to decide in the context of their own situation. Um, and I guess I, w I would say, based on what I've heard, there were three states who have acti actively considered this possibility, Louisiana, uh, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Louisiana and West Virginia decided that it was in their interest to do so. They each, however, constructed a very different package, one from the other. And Pennsylvania, looking at the same considerations but their own situation, decided against such an option. What about the impact on the federal deficit? Isn't there an implied federal subsidy when the state issues a tax-exempt bond? There is, uh, and that's an issue that um, uh, was under hot discussion for all um, state and municipal uh, tax-free bonds um, when the uh, tax bill was discussed. And today, um, the decision has been that we can live with those subsidies. Uh, that's always, I think, a topic for uh, re-examination. Okay, in your, in your testimony, when you say one of the problems with setting up a federal standard is what would be the sanction, why not simply, why not have a carrot rather than a stick? For example, give the states a benefit if they comply, such as a federal payroll tax credit or perhaps a sliding interest scale for repayment of debt. Have you considered that possibility? Well, the, the sliding interest scale on, um, on debt is one that, that actually uh, was in place uh, for the early 80s. And that kind of thing is possible. Um, but, you know, once again, it, it saying yes, it's, it's possible, maybe it is probably an oversimplified answer to a highly complex set of circumstances because I can recall a lot of very intensive discussions that Jim was really much more a party to than, than I was um, when states were trying to measure whether they had met the standards in the Social Security Act amendments in 1983. It really drove a lot of highly complex analysis at both the state and federal level in determining whether states had, in fact, done what they were going to do in order to gain the discount, delay, or deferral okay. of interest. In your testimony, you make reference to the extension of the 2 percent tax. Doesn't that simply mean that more funds will be available for loans? How does that serve as an incentive for states to rebuild their reserves? Oh, that was not, that um, two-tenths extension uh, was not envisioned in any way, as far as I know, uh, by the, during the congressional discussions as an incentive or disincentive um, for states to do anything. It's federal tax. It's collected directly by the federal government on employers. And it was a, a, an originally, <laughs> in its original incarnation, it was meant to replenish the extended unemployment compensation account for extended, the federal share of extended benefits. That deficit in the account was repaid um, in May of 87. And the extension of the two-tenths tax was not then to serve any kind of need or to offer any, in kind of, any kind of incentive. It was a separate set of considerations. What was new uh, was directing it to the loan fund as a direct deposit and okay. boosting that loan fund. Okay, just to sum up, you agree with the General Accounting Office that should a recession hit, only four states would be able to withstand the recession. But it's your view that a recession is not imminent. Is that? That's right. Okay. I, th I, I would say that it's not my view that they couldn't withstand a recession. 
I agree with them that only four states right now would meet the high cost multiple standard that they outlined. Um, that high cost multiple looks at today's balances. It does not anticipate in any way, for example, even the collections from April to June of this year, nor does it consider collections uh, throughout the rest of the year. Right, but if a recession hit tomorrow, the states could not withstand it, recognizing that the longer it takes for a recession, the greater the opportunity there are for states to build up reserves. They would, they, yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right, we'll take the next panel. Next person. The next panel is a person. Um, Mr. <laughs> Ellenberger, who's the Associate Director of Safety, Health, and Social Security at AFL-CIO, but representing the working people of America as he does, he's a panel unto himself. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be back here before you. Uh, we testified before this subcommittee two years ago when Mr. Frank was the chairman, and uh, I'm glad to see you back here, sir, and uh, recognize your deep uh, interest in the problems that the uh, nation's unemployment insurance system is, is presently facing. Um, my name is James Ellenberger, and I'm uh, pleased to be here and privileged to be here on behalf of 14 and a half million working men and women who are affiliated to unions that are part of the AFL-CIO. Those people all have deep-seated and very real interest in the functioning of this nation's unemployment insurance program. We also represent, I might add, working men and women who are not members of unions in this country. The 97 million people who are covered by and we do so with pride in their uh, behalf as well. Mr. Chairman, I'm not going to read verbatim my statement. I would ask that it be submitted into the record. I will be highlighting certain portions of it and uh, raising uh, a few other issues and would be glad to answer questions at the, uh, the completion of my uh, remarks. Last year, 1987, just 31.5%, as has been noted uh, here earlier this morning, of the unemployed received uh, UI benefits. Um, this makes four straight years in which our unemployment insurance system has set progressively worse records for the low proportion of jobless who are actually compensated by the UI system. 1984, it was 34.1%. 1985, 32.9%. 1986, 327 And in 1987, just 31.5. In May of this year, the latest month for which we have figures, just 30.8 percent of the unemployed got benefits, and tomorrow we'll know the well, terrible figures uh, for the month of June. The situation involving the nation's unemployment insurance system, along uh, with that of the nation's uh, minimum wage system, was the subject of an editorial in yesterday's Washington Post in which uh, uh, our failure to adjust these systems to meet uh, present and uh, future needs was categorized as expressions of indifference. I've attached a copy of that editorial to the testimony that we've submitted uh, for this morning's record. There are many costs to unemployment in this society, and it should be noted that um, even though uh, there's been an incredible degree of economic resurgence, that unemployment remains high historically in terms of uh, economic recovery that uh, there are nearly 7 million jobless officially rec recognized by uh, the government. There are, in addition, a large number of discouraged workers and those who are working involuntarily part-time who really should be considered whenever anyone is talking about joblessness and unemployment and unemployment insurance benefits. There are costs to individuals in this society who are unemployed, costs that we can measure in terms of financial burdens including the loss of benefits that are associated with employment, such as pensions, retirements, health care. Those things are lost when people lose their jobs. There are costs to families, oftentimes broken families as a result of unemployment. There are personal costs in terms of loss of self-esteem, mental illness, lost opportunities. There are costs to our society in terms of the contribution that we are missing 
as a result of idle people in our economy, their costs in terms of increased payments uh, from welfare systems, if such people uh, are eligible, and many of the poor and the unemployed are not eligible for welfare, their costs in terms of increased crime, their costs that the community has to suffer and uh, endure as a result of unemployment. And these are things that we really have to constantly remind ourselves of when we talk about joblessness and its burden on this society. The treatment of the long-term jobless in particular is scandalous. For all intents and purposes, the extended benefit program has been rendered meaningless by the policies of this administration and by the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1981. The need for those uh, benefits has not disappeared, but they've been made almost unattainable by a change in the trigger mechanisms by which uh, states become eligible to pay extended benefits. The number of long-term jobless has not declined as it has in previous periods of economic resurgence. In fact, it has stayed very, very high. And if you compare 1987 with 1980, uh, 1978, two periods that are substantially similar in terms of, of uh, levels of unemployment, the levels of joblessness are, are quite different. In 1987, the, the uh, level of long-term joblessness was 60 percent higher than that in 1978. The, uh, if you look at the amount of benefits that have been paid or if you look at the amount of uh, individuals who have received benefits under extent of benefits uh, between 1978 and 1987, you'll notice uh, very drastic differences. Uh, differences that place an extreme burden on those who are suffering long-term joblessness. The AFL-CIO has consistently argued, as we noted in our testimony two years ago, that one of the major factors that, is bro that has brought about this situation is the deliberate underfunding of the system. The ratio of wages subject to UI taxes was 98 percent in 1939. Today it is 34 percent. The federal taxable wage base has been changed just four times in the history of the program. The last time was in 1983 when it was raised to $7,000. Originally, all wages were subject to the Federal Unemployment Tax Act. The result, in our view, has been chronic, serious underfinancing of the system. Underfunding encourages the curtailment of benefits. It's a simple, simple formula. Keep the system underfunded in relation to needs and use that underfunding as the rationale for restricting benefits and access to benefits and keeping the benefit amounts low. The goal of this formula is to keep inadequate outlays in balance with inadequate revenues. Mr. Chairman, many of the uh, reasons for the decline in coverage of uh, the unemployed have been discussed here this morning. It is our view uh, that many of those indeed are true. We think that uh, oftentimes the, the blame uh, for that decline in coverage is misrepresented, however. We think the blame squarely belongs on the backs of the administration and not on the backs of the states, even though it is easy to point to actions that states have taken in terms of curtailing benefits. Those actions were not taken in a vacuum, however. They were taken as a direct result of encouragement by the federal government through the imposition of interest on loans, through the imposition of solvency requirements in order, to, to, uh, uh, in order for states to benefit from uh, reduced penalties and lower interest rates and the like. States were encouraged to restrict access to benefits. They were encouraged to lower benefit amounts. They were encouraged to increase disqualifying measures, all of which are uh, detailed uh, to a considerable degree in my testimony and the testimony of others. Um, these problems have been addressed by the states, not in a vacuum, but because of federal encouragement. They've, been, they've done that both in terms of increasing taxes on employers and reducing benefits. And Dr. Vroman of the Urban Institute, uh, when he testified before this subcommittee two years ago and in recent testimony that he delivered before the Ways and Means subcommittee, has detailed uh, how that burden was shared between increases of ta in taxes and decreases in benefit uh, availability to unemployed workers. Even though taxes were increased, however, I want to point out that 
employer taxes have declined by two measures. In the past 10 years, both the average employer tax rate and taxes as a percentage of total wages have dropped. UI taxes as a percentage of total wages were 1.35% in 1978, but dropped to just 1% last year. Similarly, the UI tax rate dropped from 1.29% to 1.14%. Workers are indeed bearing a burden. In some states, employers are bearing an increased burden. But if we look at the system as a whole, employers are paying less today than they have in the past. And this adds to the problem that we have underlined, that of intentional underfunding of the system. Benefit reductions have taken place in a number of areas I mentioned. Uh, they're detailed in the, in the testimony I've submitted. I want to focus a little bit on the purpose of the unemployment insurance system. It is, as uh, Dr. Bertless from the Brookings Institute has uh, noted, a pillar of our safety net in this country. During recessions and periods of economic change, the unemployment insurance system ought to function as a stabilizer for both business and the individual who's out of work. UI benefits are to provide temporary and partial income support while the jobless attempt to secure new employment. UI benefits also act to provide countercyclical stimulus to the economy, whether local or national, to help keep businesses in business. Cutting benefits and restricting access to benefits for the unemployed has the same impact as raising taxes on employers when they are experiencing economic downturns and loss of revenues. It is the opposite of what our society should do, and it runs counter to the principles and concepts of the unemployment insurance system. But that is precisely what has happened. It happened in 1982 in the midst of a recession. It was a cruel, heartless act to impose requirements on states to restrict access to UI benefits at the time of greatest need. It is also incorrect, in our view, to raise taxes on employers at the very time that businesses are suffering from economic downturn. And it underlines the need for policymakers all of us concerned with the unemployment insurance system, to do something to make sure that the system is in good shape, that we take actions to improve the economic strength of the system when economic times are, are good, in preparation for those times that we know are coming, when the economy turns down and we enter a recession. We've heard uh, this morning excellent testimony from uh, the General Accounting Office about the inadequacy of the trust funds. We would agree with, uh, with that testimony. And we think the action to address that is now, when we are in a period of economic resurgence, when it is possible to rebuild those trust fund levels so that we enter, when we do enter a recession, we have the reserves on hand in which to provide the benefits that are necessary uh, during uh, those periods of high unemployment. Failure to act will simply exacerbate the problem. As we know, it will encourage states who are forced to turn to the federal government to borrow, to restrict access to benefits, and to raise taxes on employers when employers can least afford it. The AFL-CIO has long. Mr. Hamburg, we get to the end of this? Uh, yes, sir. Kind of running kind of long. Has long supported the recommendation of the National Commission on unemployment compensation to index the taxable wage base to 65 percent of the average annual wage. We think that that would address in a very real and fundamental way the intentional underfunding of the program. We also have recommendations in terms of removing the burdens that uh, are present in the, uh, the current system in terms of access to benefits, uh, and those are detailed in attachments to our statement. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have no questions because I think you've stated the case very well. I would just underline the point. There is a wholly mistaken notion that this administration is guided by, which is that if things are going better for most of us, you don't have to worry about social justice for the few for whom things are not going better. And it is simply wrong. The gross national product can go up at a very high rate year after year, and that's a good thing for most people. It's a good thing for the country as a whole. But in a country as large as this, there will be some people who will not do well. And in fact, as you point out, Mr. Elmer, I think quite correctly, uh, recessions are not the time to worry about this. It is precisely when the economy is going well as a whole, it's precisely when we've got some revenues coming in that we ought to be providing for those people who, through no fault of their own, aren't going to be doing well. 
And I have to say, I think this administration has brought on itself some of the problems it complains about in the trade area. If you continue to follow a policy that leaves people who lose their jobs because of imports bereft of support, you shouldn't be surprised when people react very emotionally against those imports. Uh, this administration has helped me to understand a phrase that I didn't fully understand. John Kennedy used to say of Franklin Roosevelt, he can be a good neighbor abroad because he was a good neighbor at home, meaning that he was able to pursue a policy of cooperation with Latin America because people in the United States felt that he had their needs at heart. This administration, time and time again, whether it was trade adjustment assistance for workers who were hurt, unemployment where uh, the basic safety net has been riddled, they weaken our ability to provide for those among us who are hurt. And then they wonder why they get such kind of emotional reactions. There's just no justification for the kind of things you're talking about. Uh, there are people who try to find jobs, can't find jobs. Everybody agrees to that. And to cut back and cut back and cut back, uh, precisely when things are, are not terrible for everybody else, I think is without justification. Uh, it may take us next year to, to do it, but I, I appreciate your reminding us. And I think this is a, it's an economic and a moral obligation. Of course, it's also interesting that people who've been trying to dismantle the system, when we had the stock market drop of October of last year, and there was incipient panic, all of the conservatives wrote articles about how wonderful it is that this is not 1929 because we have in place all of those provisions, uh, nearly all of which, the enactment of which they opposed. So they talked about how this is not 1929 because we've got all these safeguards. Uh, neglecting to mention, probably there wasn't space in the article, that they had opposed the uh, enactment of the safeguards. Unemployment insurance is one of them. Unemployment insurance, as you know, is one of the things that we now have that we didn't have before that keeps recessions from feeding on themselves. And so it makes both economic and moral sense to do better. And I just appreciate your elaborating on that. Mr. Grant. Thank you, General. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just before I leave, I, I neglected to mention earlier, uh, it's not part of my testimony, but I have given a copy of a report from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. How long is it? Uh, it is, uh, I believe, nine pages. Sir. Nine pages we can put in the record like without objection. Have that put in the record. Without Thank objection. you very much. Okay. And uh, the final witness is Betty Justice, Betsy Justice, Chairman of the Employment Security Commission of North Carolina. Uh, Robert Maluli, who is the manager of the Unemployment Insurance Actuarial Service uh, of the Illinois Department of Employment Security. Uh, a few last minute changes here we had to read. Uh, Ms. Justice and Mr. Maluli, uh, please proceed. And we have Ms. Justice here first, so we'll start with you. Thank you. And Mr. I'm going to have to excuse myself now in the game of musical chairs, but we do want to assure you it is not for lack of interest, and your testimony is having a very real impact, and we will be paying attention to it. Mr. Grant will preside. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have with me the uh, UI Director, Unemployment Insurance Director for the State of North Carolina, Preston Johnson. If you should have any questions, that is the reason I've asked Mr. Johnson to join me. At your invitation, uh, you requested that I answer three concerns. I will try to do that in the sequence of events. I will not, as you will note, uh, use my testimony uh, verbatim. I will not read from it because there are some particular areas that I feel like need to be highlighted. I think the reason that North Carolina was asked to, to participate in this uh, subcommittee hearing was because North Carolina has been quite innovative in looking at its unemployment insurance fund and looking at some taxes to assist the growth of that fund within the state of North Carolina. Your first uh, question was the capacity of the states to build reserves in the unemployment insurance fund while repaying loans. North Carolina has not had the necessity to repay loans. We've been very uh, fortunate in our conservative physical management that we've not had to do that. I can give you an example of a situation where we were at a dangerously low level and the initiative that was taken by the state. In early of 83, our trust fund had declined to approximately 200 million and the Department of Labor had forecast that by 84 that our fund would be depleted. In lieu of that, the Employment Security Commission and several of our private employers urged our legislator to uh, pass some amendments to the North Carolina Employment Security Law, which would rebuild and maintain our trust fund. It was twofold. First, it required changing the taxable wage base from its fixed level of 7,000 to a flexible tax base of 60% of the average annual wage. This would keep growth in taxable wages in line with benefit liability, plus would prevent 
the continual shifting of the tax burden to the low wage employers. Second, it required a temporary escalated tax ranging from 10 to 40 percent each year. This was designed to rebuild the trust fund at a more rapid rate during a forecast period of a healthy economy, which I note has been the topic of discussion this day as to the strength of the economy, and now is the time to strengthen your trust fund. The net result of this legislation was a significant tax increase for our employers. Nevertheless, during the committee hearings, every employer group in the state testified in favor of the increased taxes. It was passed una almost unanimously within the legislature. Two years ago, we could see our trust fund rebuilding at a rate faster than was required, and this was due to the unexpected rapid increase in North Carolina's economy. In fact, in 1987, our average unemployment rate was 4.5 percent. We have a civilian labor force of 3.2, and approximately 3.1 million are employed to date. To address this issue, a committee of employer groups and the Employment Security Commission staff and some private industry met together and talked about our fund. The trust fund had grown from the $200 million mentioned in 19. 84 to 1 billion, which is the current trust fund balance is 1.2 billion. It became evident to us that our fund was growing substantially faster than was necessary to cover the total outlay of benefits. The committee recommended and our commission endorsed and the governor of our state supported two major changes in our law to reduce the trust fund growth rate. First, repeal of the escalator tax that was passed in 83 and second, and overall reduction in tax rates, including lower minimum tax rates. This legislation was enacted, was passed in March of 87, and it was made retroactive to January the 1st of 1987. It resulted in an approximately 40 percent reduction in employer taxes when we compare with 1986. I will also note to you that even in this piece of legislation, we increased our weekly benefit amount to our employees, to those claimants who are eligible for benefits, uh, at the same time that we, in, that we decreased the employer tax and instituted our own worker training trust fund, which I will cover shortly. As for benefits for unemployed workers, we feel that our benefit formula is excellent. It is designed to provide a benefit approximately equal to one-half the weekly wage loss for about 87 percent of all claimants. As I noted earlier, we increased our benefit amount, which is the highest in the Southeast right now. This maximum is recomputed every year, and the next computation date is August the 1st, of which we also do our experience rating, which is a determining factor for the employer tax. At this time, on August the 1st of 1988, the weekly benefit amount will be recalculated at 66 and two-thirds of the average weekly wage in the state of North Carolina. The second area you asked me about was our state reserve fund and the reasons North Carolina chose to do this. In looking at North Carolina and looking at the growth of our fund and looking at the federal cut cutbacks that North Carolina has experienced since 1981, we have lost in excess of 500 positions within our state. Our local offices are, are combined for job service and unemployment insurance. We have 78 local offices across the state and five branches. The committee with the endorsement of our legislators agreed that it was time for North Carolina to take the initiative. We were lowering our taxes to our employers, we were increasing our weekly benefit amount, and at the same time we were looking at a substantial federal funding cutback. We needed to keep our local offices open, we needed to continue to provide the service to the unemployed and those looking for employment in the state of North Carolina. In doing so, the committee recommended, and it was passed, that a 20 percent add-on to the state unemployment insurance tax be added. That is, we were giving a reduction on one end and taking on another tax, attaching it to the federal of 20 percent. The fund is administered by the state treasurer's office. The fund in itself 
will serve two purposes. The interest off the fund. The reserve fund is set aside. It will not be activated unless the fund in Washington is depleted. It is a backup for the state of North Carolina. In addition to that, the fund, the interest off of this fund, can be used for three reasons or three purposes. It can be used to keep our local offices within the Employment Security Commission open. It can provide refunds to employers. It can fund programs specific, specifically for the benefit of unemployed workers, including but not limited to adult basic education, adult high school or equivalent programs, occupational skill training programs, assessment, job counseling, and placement programs. We think that's one of the key elements within this uh, fund, the State Reserve Fund and a Worker Training Trust Fund, is the interest off of the State Reserve Fund gives North Carolina the option to train those individuals that are having difficulty finding jobs in the state of North Carolina. It is there for labor force development and is there to continue to provide a service. We chose this approach to reduce the impact of federal budget cuts rather than levy a separate tax on employers, specifically for Employment Security Commission operations. As you know, our employers across the nation are paying considerably more in feudal taxes than are being appropriated back to the states to administer the Employment Security Commission uh, system. Even though these tax monies may not be used for any other purpose and are just shown as growing surplus in that account. It was felt that a separate state tax on employers for a service on which they have already been taxed was grossly unfair to the employer community. The State Reserve Fund for the State of North Carolina and the Worker Training Trust Fund, we feel, provide a fair way to reduce the budget cut impacts since only the interest earned from the employer taxes will be used to offset budget cuts. Well, it's been one and a half years since that fund was established. We currently have slightly more than $50 million in the State Reserve Fund and approximately $3 million in the Worker Training Trust Fund. Our legislators are in session. There is an appropriations bill now being considered of which $1.3 million or approximately $1.6 million is being considered for focused industrial training through the community college system to assist those individuals who may be losing their jobs due to obsolescence of skills. And that will be across the state of North Carolina. The additional $1.3 million or $1.6 will be appropriated to our agency to keep our local offices open to cover the additional 41 position cuts that we are anticipating for this fiscal year. We estimate that by 1991, we will have approximately $200 million in our state reserve fund, and that the interest to the Worker Training Trust Fund will amount to some $40 million, about $15 million in 1991 alone. Already, we've had inquiries from about 25 states across the nation, including Hawaii, who visited our office in order to uh, see our local offices in operation and to also look at the fund itself. The third area you requested that I address was a recommendation to encourage adequate state reserves and maintain an attractive economic climate for industry and labor. I think as we've all heard here today, there's no easy way to accomplish this, nor is there a quick fix where reserves are inadequate. The principle to accomplish this is very simple. Tax revenues for unemployment insurance benefits must keep pace with the potential liability to pay these benefits. One of the original principles of the unemployment insurance was to build up a reserve during good economic times to pay benefits to the unemployed during downturns. We've heard that reiterated on several occasions this day. Implementation becomes very difficult. Competing forces, one wanting higher benefits for unemployed workers and other wanting lower taxes for employers, if successful, will always result in, in inadequate reserves. One step toward addressing solvency, which 16 states have already implemented, is a flexible tax base. It is only logical that as wages continue to rise each year, tax revenues must keep pace. 
Without a tax base, that keeps pace with wage increases. Any increase in tax revenues must be borne to a greater and greater degree by low-wage employers. Once a state determines what UI coverage or benefit levels are proper for them, then action is necessary. There are actuarial methods which can determine the tax revenue required to build and maintain a solvent reserve fund. Mr. Chairman, I have limited my comments, and I thank you very much for this opportunity. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I think this would be a good time to go vote. If you'll just hold on, we'll be back momentarily. Mr. Malouli, why don't we have your testimony? Who's Mr. Malouli? You're Mr. Malouli. Why don't we have your testimony, and then we can uh, have some questions. Okay. I'm uh, Robert Malouli, manager of Unemployment Insurance Actuarial Services, and I'm here representing uh, Sally A. Ward, or Jackson, I'm sorry, who's the director of the Illinois Department of Employment Security. And my left is Henry Jackson of our Economic Information and Analysis Division. In my remarks, I'll address the problems faced by the Illinois UI system and the solution that we chose I will also comment on federal solvency standards for state UI trust funds. To give an idea of the problem that Illinois faced, in 1973, manufacturing represented 38% of total employment in the state. By 1987, manufacturing accounted for only 19% of our jobs. What did this do to our UI fund? Well, in the beginning of 1970, we had a net reserves of $500 million, which seemed to be adequate in light of the past benefit payments that ranged less than $100 million a year. However, while Illinois paid only $89 million in benefits in 1969, by 1970, benefit payouts doubled to $180 million. Benefit payments more than quadrupled from 1970 to 1975 when annual total benefit payments reached $748 million. By 1982, benefit payments more than doubled again, and the total for Illinois was now $1.8 billion. Benefit payments remained high in 1983, we paid an all-time high of $244 million in a single month. Taxes increased drastically as well. Illinois collected $57 million in UI taxes in 1970. Collections increased to over $1 billion by 1983. While average tax rates increased 20-fold over this period, it was not enough to prevent the Illinois UI system from becoming insolvent. The state had to borrow from the federal government. This debt peaked at $2.5 billion in 1983. Could Illinois have avoided the situation? Well, we've looked at it, and it's very unlikely. More prompt action to cut benefits and raise taxes could have helped, but it would not have been enough. Had we followed the example of the states that never had to borrow, Illinois would still have incurred over a billion dollars in UI debt during this period. States were slow to react for a number of reasons. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, Cong Congress uh, suspended the uh, feudal penalty taxes for a period, uh, and there was uh, th an expectation that the Congress would go in and forgive some of the debt. Uh, these rules were changed very abruptly. Uh, instead of uh, uh, forgiving the, uh, the debts, uh, the Congress went in and, uh, effective on April 1st of 1982, imposed interest on any new loans. The imposition of interest came at a very bad time, but the overall effect was a good one for the system. State legislatures, business representatives, and labor organizations were compelled to work together to find a solution to the insolvency of their UI program. They recognized their roles and acted responsibly. Unfortunately, there's an area in the program that uh, the rules are not nearly as clear, and that's the administrative financing. States are responsible for running their programs, uh, but the funding of these programs comes from the federal government. Uh, the Secretary of Labor allocates the money to the states. Uh, historically, state administrative decisions which raise the cost of operating state programs have been rewarded through the federal funding mechanism. This process actively discourages states from uh, reducing the cost of their programs and undertaking uh, various efficiencies. This arrangement does not seem reasonable. Uh, the Congress should consider turning over the financing of the administrative costs to the states. States are already responsible for financing benefits, which are on average 90% of the cost of these programs. It seems entirely reasonable that states could be held accountable for managing the remaining 10% for administration. 
But what did Illinois do to, to solve its insolvency problem? There was various attempts uh, throughout the period, but it was not until 1983 that uh, extreme action was taken. Illinois was in the depths of the second recession in three years, and the Congress had imposed interest on any new UI loans af after, after April 1st of 1982. Business and labor leaders also recognized that they faced a common problem which would require sacrifices from both sides if the solution was to help the state's ability to recover economically. After intense negotiations, Governor Thompson secured an agreement that resulted in a $2 billion solvency package. Business agreed to contribute 60% through increased taxes and labor's, labor agreed to contribute 40% through reduced benefit payouts. This package, coupled with improving economic conditions, finally restored solvency to the Illinois UI system, but it required long-term sacrifices. Over a period of five years, Illinois collected almost $3 billion more in tax revenue than was paid out in benefits. This enabled the state to completely repay its UI debt at the end of 1987 and we closed the year with a trust fund balance of over $300 million. Illinois adopted some unique provisions to address this problem because there was a conscious decision on the part of business and labor not to build up an overly large UI trust fund. We simply could not afford it. Illinois linked benefit levels to the conditions in the trust fund. We established triggers which would uh, allow for either a freeze on, on benefits or a 10% reduction if all three triggers were met. On the, on the tax side, the employers agreed to a special surcharge. If the fund balance falls below $80 million on May 15th of any year, a surcharge char is triggered uh, to uh, help avoid the imposition of feudal penalties. We decided we'd rather tax ourselves to fund our system than to uh, uh, incur the uh, federal penalty taxes again. In essence, this legislation, which took effect in 1988, institutionalizes the principle that business and labor share responsibility for maintaining the solvency of the UI system. It also helps Illinois responsibly manage its UI system without holding extraordinary amounts in its UI trust fund. I understand that the committee is interested in the issue of the optimum balance for trust funds. While the Congress may be urged to mandate the 1.5 standard that was ad, uh, addressed earlier, we would uh, caution against that approach. For Illinois, this would mean a trust fund balance of between 3.9 billion, and if we adopted the 3.0 standard, 7.9 billion dollars. We must be very prudent when we're managing our UI system. Holding too much in the UI trust fund can be bad for a state's economy. The assets of the trust fund are capital which would otherwise be available to the businesses in the state. When deciding how much money to have on hand, the state must, must balance the need for prudent reserves against the cost of those reserves to its economy. States with a recovering economy, such as Illinois, must be especially careful. We're not in the situation that North Carolina faces. This, is, this decision is not one that can be made in Washington. It must be made at the state level and continuously reevaluated as economic conditions change within the state. The money in the, in the trust fund should serve a purpose. We shouldn't hold money that will not be used. And to quote, uh, paraphrase Claude Pepper uh, uh, when he was speaking about the Social Security trust funds, every dollar in the trust fund should have a reasonable chance of being used to pay benefits. If there's no, little or no chance that a dollar will ever be used to pay benefits, what purpose does it serve? Should states ever plan to borrow? Illinois thinks that we should. States could face a situation if they wanted to avoid borrowing where they would be faced with cutting benefits below what would be a reasonable replacement for lost wages or raising taxes so high that it would drive businesses into bankruptcy or force them to leave the state. States with the, which exhaust their trust funds can borrow from a special account set up specifically for that purpose. We should not think that borrowing is something to be avoided at all costs. And in conclusion, I would suggest that the proper role for the federal government with respect to unemployment insurance is that of a prudent banker. I think to go beyond that role is inappropriate. States need to understand that they must carefully manage their own UI system. Congress should not send conflicting messages by attempting to manage state trust funds legislatively. 
I recognize that it will be very difficult for the individual states to balance the need for trust fund reserves with the cost of building those reserves. But the individual states are in the best position to do this successfully. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Ms. Justice, uh, tell me again where the, the state of North Carolina gets the revenues uh, from for the state uh, reserve fund. The state of North Carolina actually had an opportunity because our fund was growing so quickly in Washington. Uh, we were able to reduce our employer tax uh, in excess of about 14, well, about 14 percent the first time. That fund, the, the state reserve fund, is built on what have been, would have been a total tax uh, refund to the employer in a sense of a tax reduction. We initiated a state reserve fund based on a 20 percent or a 14 percent tax, between 14 and 20 percent. What would have been a total rebate to them, it's the employer agreed to allow us to tax them. It's a surtax mm -hmm. that's added on to the existing federal tax. Mm -hmm. But you're still a part of the federal Yes, sir. System. We still have a federal, uh, uh, we, before we made that decision, we consulted uh, with USDOL regarding that mm -hmm. before we made the decision to set up our own fund and, and, and initiated that piece of legislation. But what I want to make sure of is what you use that fund for. Now, you use that for retraining and sensitive uh, job areas. No, sir. Is that right? uh, the state reserve fund is set aside. It cannot be utilized for anything except to pay benefits to the unemployed. It will be activated when the fund in Washington reaches a level of depletion or, or near a zero level. I would also like to say that our fund, the State Reserve Fund, has a cap on it. Uh, once it reaches 1 percent of the total uh, taxable wage base, or total tax, taxes, wages in North Carolina, that it will be uh, the, the uh, reserve fund will reach its cap, and therefore that tax will, will no longer be uh, legislated. What would that be in dollars? In dollar amounts, I, you know, I have to ask Mr. Johnson, do you remember? About a quarter of a billion in today's dollars. Mm -hmm. So you have, you'll have more in, did you say 1991, you think? Yes, sir. We it? anticipate the cap being reached in 1991. So in your state reserve fund, you'll have more dollars and some states have in their uh, trust fund. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. How many people does North Carolina have in population? Uh, six million. Um, um, Mr. Grant, you, you did ask me about the total fund and I, I, you were asking about the training. I'd like to say mm -hmm. that the interest off of that fund is being applied for training in the state of North Carolina. That is the only way that revenue can be used by, by state law. Did you have a great deal of resistance from, uh, from employers to this proposal? Uh, no, sir, uh, in that the committee that made the recommendation was comprised of several employer organizations as well as private employers. Mm -hmm. It was about a 14-member committee, and they studied our experience rating system for about a year before they came up with their, their recommendations. Uh, the employer community uh, for our state is, was very supportive of it. And what's your unemployment rate in North Carolina? The 1987 average annual unemployment rate was 4.5. As mm -hmm. of the month of May, a month of June, it was at 3.5, which is the lowest that we've had in about 15 years. Well, 71.6 percent of your unemployed don't get any benefits. How do you respond to that? Seventy-one percent of the unemployed and twenty-eight percent do receive benefits, and we are paying the, the, the largest percentage in the southeast that's eligible for benefits receive them. You're paying... You, Twenty-eight percent of the, pe of the uh, people who are, or about thirty percent, are receiving benefits. Now, when you say seventy-one percent that are unemployed, mm -hmm are not receiving benefits. Mm -hmm. The 71 percent who are unemployed who are not receiving benefits could, have, could be attributed to the fact that they quit their jobs and they're ineligible. Mm -hmm. 
whenever you have a very low unemployment rate, people are much quicker to quit a job as a volunteer quit in seeking other employment opportunities and will go by an unemployment office or an employment office, as we prefer to call it, and initiate their claim and at the same time be looking for other employment, which means they may go to work within a two-week period. Uh, we have done an experiment with that and found that in an early intervention that we can have the people back at work with, uh, within about four weeks uh, and save uh, the trust fund about $1.7 million a month. Well, by of, doing your, that. of your total unemployed, what is the average length of unemployment? The average length of unemployment, the average length of time that they are pay paid benefits is less than eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Justice, can I ask you, do you know that for a fact as to the 71 percent, why they are not being covered, or is that just speculation? Have you done a study to examine the 70 uh, one plus percent who are unemployed and who are not receiving benefits. Does that have you done a study to show that in fact these people quit their jobs and that is why they are not eligible, or could there be other reasons as well? We have not done a study. In Florida, over a third of our uh, uh, benefits are paid from interest on uh, our uh, reserve. What's the case in North Carolina? Mr. Johnson. In excess of, in excess of 40 percent last year. No wonder North Carolina is sending all those banks to Florida. You people know <laughs> what you're doing up there. <laughs> taking, taking the money from Florida and financing that business. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Maloney, what, could you have forecast uh, the uh, the increase in the benefit payout? I think if we did, no one would have believed us. Um, we have a very elaborate forecasting tool uh, in a computer model, and we run a variety of economic assumptions through it. Uh, we ran our current law through the last double-dip recession, and it forces us to borrow, but we recover very quickly. Uh, if we told people that uh, our benefit payout was going to increase uh, as drastically as it had, uh, uh, it just would not be believed. It's D did you tell them? The forecasting tools were not available back in the mid-70s. Uh, it's a fairly recent development uh, beginning in 1983 uh, to uh, really take control of the system and begin to look at what are the options, what are the costs of various alternatives. And we can cost out a wide variety of economic uh, assumptions or legislative proposals and tell the state legislatures what that means in terms of continued growth, a severe recession, modest recessions, long-term recessions, and they're in a better position to, uh, to decide what to do with the UI system. They are continuously involved. Business and labor meet uh, uh, practically every quarter and look at the, uh, the outputs from our forecasting tools. 70, almost 71 percent of your total unemployed received no benefits. 71 percent, and yet your your reserve fund now is it was it 200 million? Did you it say it was 300 million at 300 the end million. of the year? Uh -huh. um, it's very difficult to tell what's happening to people who don't come through our doors, which is the majority of the 71 percent that don't receive benefits. But if someone is laid off from their job, and they have the required qualifying wages, which in Illinois are only $1,600 in a four-quarter period, uh, and they meet the eligibility requirements, they are paid benefits. We, in the major solvency effort in 83, we did not eliminate eligibility for any of our claimants. The, you don't, uh, I'll phrase it a different way, do you think then that you may have a very large potential unfunded responsibility? Not in terms of that 71 percent. Uh, those are people who have either chosen not to come in or would not be eligible if they did. Reentrants to the labor force who don't have any prior wages 
are not eligible for unemployment in Illinois, mm -hmm. and that's true in probably most of the states. How long are they eligible in Illinois? 26 weeks is the maximum benefit eligibility. What about North Carolina, Mr. 26 weeks? Mm -hmm. Just one question. Mr. Malouli, unlike North Carolina, where a surcharge is triggered on the upturn of the economy, in Illinois, you tax, surcharge tax is triggered on the downturn when a recession is about to begin, and it seems when business are least able to pay it. Does that make sense? Well, the surcharge that triggers in would only trigger in under conditions in which the federal penalty tax would all trigger in anyway. Uh, it's at a lower rate, and those proceeds in many instances are enough to avoid the triggering of the federal penalty taxes. So it's not a situation of uh, avoiding a tax. It's just that we've decided to tax ourselves a little bit sooner at a lower rate to avoid the imposition of federal penalties. But why not tax yourself when the economy is good? to build up the reserves for when the economy goes down? Well, you have to realize the situation that a state like Illinois finds itself in. Uh, we had tremendous economic dislocation. We lost uh, half a million jobs in the manufacturing sector alone. Uh, to raise our taxes uh, over and above what was required to get us out of the recent difficulties, to build a trust fund balance of $4 billion, let's say, would make it extremely difficult for our businesses to compete with businesses in North Carolina, for example. Well, because isn't that the argument then for a federal standard? Then you won't have to worry about your businesses competing with businesses in North Carolina or any other states because all the states would have to maintain the same level of adequate reserves. But that stand the money to, to meet that standard has to come from someplace. It has to come from the employers in the state. There really is no other choice. And to raise taxes over and above what's required to pay current benefits and build a reasonable uh, reserve in your trust fund uh, after a, a, a period of very serious economic dislocation would not be good for the state. It would probably create more unemployment because businesses would simply leave. Uh, we do presentations to uh, plant site committees all the time, and unemployment insurance costs are one of the very first things they ask about. And if we had to raise our taxes to accumulate $4 billion over a few years, uh, it would make us uncompetitive compared to just about any other but state. But isn't the basic premise of the unemployment insurance program when it was set up by Congress 53 years ago was to maintain reserves for tough times and to, maintain, to gather those reserves during the good years? Well, it's, it's not, it's counter-cyclical, okay? And what the structure of all the state UI tax systems is designed to do is to collect the taxes after the economic downturn has occurred. And our system does that. Well, it was Carolyn Golding mentioned that this morning. It's a three-year cycle. Businesses lay off workers. They collect benefits. The taxes on those businesses don't increase immediately. And when they do increase, they have three years in which to pay off the, uh, the costs of those benefits. And the system is designed to work that way. But if a recession should hit in the near future, what would its impact be on your state? Well, if a modest recession were to occur, we wouldn't have any difficulty. If a severe recession, similar to the, the period from 1980 through 1983, where we had two very serious recessions in, in rapid succession, uh, we would probably borrow on the order of a billion dollars. But we would pay it back in very short order. The system is designed to recover those benefits after the recovery occurs and pay off the, the debts. And the states pay interest on those loans. So there is no real cost to the federal government unless the, the, uh, the cap of 10 percent is reached. It's a very prudent arrangement to avoid the situation where a state would be forced to cut benefits below what be a, a meaningful replacement of lost wages or raise taxes such that it drives businesses into bankruptcy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no other question. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.
If you'd like more information on this hearing on the unemployment insurance system, you can contact the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing in room B-349A of the Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Major events that air on C-SPAN are previewed in the C-SPAN Update, the network's weekly newspaper. The update gives you the big picture on the week through its reports on programs we